but um, I want to start by welcoming everybody here and thanks so much for joining us. This is our first dive into using technology to share history with an audience. Um, thanks to Rick Gefkin for being brave enough to be our guinea pig in this little endeavor. Um, I'm Stacy Slowinski, you may know that. I'm hosting this event on behalf of the Friends of the Corporate House and the Tinton Falls Historic Preservation Commission. Um, my colleague, Mike Lee, another fellow Historic Commission member is here helping me out. He is going to manage the chat. So as we go forward, if you, you guys are all muted, your audio is muted, but if you wanna ask a question, you can either type it in the chat or raise your hand and Mike's going to um, feed the questions to Rick at appropriate times. So don't hesitate to ask questions. Rick would love to have your comments and questions as he goes forward. A um, Couple of other housekeeping notes. This session is gonna be recorded, so we'll make it available to anybody who missed it or if you have to leave early or for whatever reason um, you wanna see it again. Um, and uh, I think that's probably it. Talked about the chat. Now, um, introduce our guest of honor, Rick Gefkin. He's a local author and general friend of the Crawford House. Thanks for being here, Rick. We appreciate having you. He's done a number of um, presentations for us at the Crawford House, written a number of books as well. And um, I think I'm gonna throw this to him and let him get started. Okay, great. Everybody uh, doing well, I hope, and safe and healthy. And thanks for uh, coming into our Zoom presentation. Um, it's fairly uh, new technology to most of us, although it's been out there in the market for a while. Uh, if I can figure out how to get a Zoom haircut, I'll be really happy here, and my, <laughs> but I haven't been able to do that yet. So as you can see, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some kind of fascinating things, I hope, for you uh, that I found out about Monmouth County, um, cover of uh, the book I did with Muriel Smith last year. And um, if you don't mind, I'm going to bring you on a personal journey uh, along with Monmouth County history to show you um, kind of how I found out a lot of these things. Um, so, excuse this, but that's me in uh, 1948, which uh, you can do some calculations since I was three years old, you can tell how old I am. Um, I was fortunate, I was uh, born and raised in Hudson County, named after Henry Hudson, of course, but I was had the great good fortune of my parents bringing my sister Nancy and I down to the Highlands every summer and here I am with a friend of ours, Walter Bloom, in his boat. And right over my shoulder there is a twin lights you can see here in the Highlands. And uh, ironically, as I prepared this presentation, I realized that I was sitting in that boat that year about where Henry Hudson had been all those years before. Um, I will tell you that the place that I uh, summered was called Gravelly Point in the Waterwitch section of Highlands which as a kid didn't mean a whole lot to me. I just thought it was kind of a weird name. Um, but as it turned out, it was pretty close to a few things that are gonna play into our story. Uh, up the block from Gravelly Point was a place called Huddy Park. Uh, not too far from there in Atlantic Highlands was what we called Henry Hudson Springs. And also you'll all recognize, I'm sure, the famous twin lights up on the top of Mount Mitchell. Um, it turned out that when I was a little kid, uh, what's Paul, what, can we pause for one second? Um, so are we sharing, uh, the screen visible for everyone to see? I believe so. Okay. Can I get, can I get verification that people can see the screen, what he's yeah, doing uh, right now? It's a picture. Waiting, of, uh, so I think they can see it. All right. I just got a um, message that somebody couldn't see it. Okay. Um, so. As uh, as I'll continue, and Michael in the background fix that. Okay, up. yeah, no, we're good to go. Sorry, keep going. So um, those three places, uh, which I didn't understand as a young boy, uh, were as historic as they turned out to be. Um, got really interesting as life went on. Um, by the time I was eight or nine, I was lucky enough here as my dad and my sister at one of the little bungalows in this community, and that's my first bike, I think. And you get to an age in life where your parents trust you to travel around a little bit more. So my friends and I would do that, and we would visit all these places that I just showed you. Uh, and of course, we had no sense of the history of them. But I want to bring you through some of them now, uh, as I found out as an adult. As I said, it turned out that where I was in that little picture in 1948 
was in, uh, you know, actually the Shrewsbury River part of Sandy Hook Bay, where uh, 300 years before that, the natives had looked out one day and saw a very strange apparition. Um, and it was a ship by a man, an Englishman actually, named Henry Hudson, who was under the employ of the Dutch to explore the New World. And he pulled into uh, Sandy Hook Bay, um, and he was met by canoe fills, uh, canoes filled with what he didn't understand were uh, what we know now to be Lenape Indians. Uh, of course, you know that he was in the half moon. A um, little background, the Lenapes had a pretty wide range, not just New Jersey, as you can see here, but also into uh, Long Island here on the left, uh, obviously into New York, Pennsylvania, and even down into Delaware. Uh, interesting group of uh, Native Americans, they were Algonquin people, probably here from about the year 10,000 or so as the Indians moved across country toward the East Coast. Um, they retained uh, and do still retain out in Oklahoma where some of their descendants are, a really cool oral history about the meeting. And their oral history says that one day a floating island showed up in their territory with white billowy clouds. And these strange looking men got out and they had some, uh, some meetings with them. Of course, they were talking about, we think, possibly Henry Hudson's ship and the white clouds would have been the sails. Um, and that's been a longstanding tradition on the Lenape people. Um, they were... Um, quite different than the Plains Indians that we all saw growing up as, you know, cowboys in Indian movies. Uh, they look kind of like this. Here's one of their sachems called Tish Kohan. He wasn't actually one of the men who met Henry Hudson. Um, that wouldn't happen for years later, but certainly some of the more prominent people would have met Hudson and his crew. Um, you can see in this interesting depiction of a man named Tish Kohan that he's carrying a probably a Dutch clay pipe. So this would have been many years later after contact. Uh, Tish Kohan uh, was not the actual guy that, uh, that Hudson meant, but he's representative of the kinds of folks uh, that we see. Um, continuing along, years and years later in Atlantic Highlands, in this old postcard, there was something called the spout, okay? And you can see a guy here probably getting some water when I was a kid uh, on my bike with my friends, we used to go up to this place. Uh, it was about oh, a half a mile or so along what we call Lower Scenic Drive. Um, and it looked like that then, and pretty much still does. And what it is, is a series of pipes coming out of the side of Lower Mount Mitchell, actually, in Atlantic Highlands. And we used to bring up our little water bottles and get this fresh spring water. And it turned out that people believe that that may be where Henry Hudson and his uh, folks stopped to uh, renew the water supply for their ships. At least that's been historically um, brought down to us. Uh, and so we would go up there quite a lot. And you can see this thing had been built up over the years uh, as a memorial to Henry Hudson. So uh, we're trying to continue along. The Dutch took over New York, of course, in Manhattan. Um, early on, and they administered New Jersey out of Lower Manhattan. Um, turns out that uh, about 1664 or 65, the British took some ships into the harbor. Peter Syverson gave up New York, and we became part of um, New Jersey then, which was not New Jersey, became part of the uh, New Amsterdam area which had changed its name to New York at that point. Um, this guy plays a prominent role. Uh, although he may look like he's part of the hair club for men, it's actually the Duke of York uh, in England. And he grants an awful lot of land to the folks that he wanted to encourage. Uh, as a matter of fact, Richard Nichols, who took over for um, Peter Stuyvesant, said that after the uh, English took over, New York and New Jersey. He wanted uh, to settle, uh, have colonists come over. And so he granted what was called a patent or a deed, which came down to be called the Navasink Tract. Um, that was named after the Navasink Band of the Lenapes. Uh, 
12 Gravesend men, Gravesend in Brooklyn, mostly Quakers, were English settlers, and he asked them to come over to New Jersey and purchase some land from the Lenapes, which they did. And thus began Monmouth County. Uh, it wasn't called that yet for many, many years. Um, this patent, so-called, was a deed signed that day, and that's the official kind of uh, beginning of our county. And you can see here Richard Nichols gave uh, to these men from, um, these uh, 12 men from uh, Gravesend, uh, land that they he asked to they have purchased it from the uh the natives and so here is the original monmouth patent it encompasses well, all of what is now monmouth county and also some of ocean county it was a huge land grant and so our history began way back when skip ahead a little bit uh, you remember that i told you that i grew up and spent summers in a place called water witch which name i did not know a lot about but this man, who you might recognize, is James Fenimore Cooper. And it turns out that he wrote a book called The Water Witch, uh, or The Skimmer of the Seas, as he called it. Interesting guy, a New Jersey guy born in Burlington County that year. Uh, commissioned a midshipman in the Navy around the turn of the century. And then as that naval officer, he was in and out of Sandy Hook in the New York area quite a lot and knew a lot about it. And so in 1830, he wrote this book about a ship called the Water Witch, um, which name got associated with the part of the Highlands that I grew up in. Um, about 1900, when Highlands Incorporated, they actually took many of the street names from his book. And those names are still there. Anybody that knows that part of town uh, will recognize some of that from uh, James Fenimore Cooper. I'm going to skip to a part that I revere in my little history of Monmouth County. Uh, as I mentioned, my friends and I would frequently take our bikes up to the top of Mount Mitchell, which is about 280 feet, the highest point in the East Coast, directly on the coast between Maine and Florida. And you can see here as they constructed this new lighthouse overlooking Sandy Hook Bay, and here is Sandy Hook, and beyond Brooklyn, and here's Staten Island. Turns out that around 1862, the federal government decided to build from local brownstone for that enormous amount of money then, what became, as you well know, the Twin Lights of Navasink. Um, it looked like that at, at its completion. This is the Twin Lights here. Uh, these are telegraph towers that were added later off that property. Um, these two towers, as you can see and probably know, that's the square tower, that's octagonal, were uh, designed differently. And they were supposed to be distinguishable because of the twin lights from other nearby lighthouses. And as you could tell from this promontory, that was along the entryway to lower New York Bay up through here. So it was an important lighthouse. Interestingly enough, the design was actually inspired by the Corps of Engineers castle insignia for the United States Army. So it's got some history of its own right there. Um, lighthouse keepers, by the way, were paid, uh, but they were not trained. They were former sea captains or people with military special naval background. Uh, in the back of Twin Lights, if you've been up there lately, there's the quarters that uh, those men uh, lived as they took care of the lighthouses. Uh, it was the first lighthouse on the, uh, actually in the continental United States to use what was called a Fresnel lens, invented by a Frenchman, of course, very refractive lens that allowed the uh, lard oil light in the beginning to be uh, pushed way out to sea. In fact, it was visible for 22 miles out, and uh, there were some stories that at night sky, the reflection of the lower cloud cover could be seen from 70 miles away. And as wonderful as that sounds for us, the local folks that lived up here in the Navasin Hills didn't quite like it as much as you might think. Um, they complained that they couldn't sleep with the bright light. Their chickens wouldn't lay eggs and their cows refused to give milk. So there's always good with the bad, right? Twin Lights uh, has been with us since, of course, uh, 1862. Here's a picture from the Library of Congress uh, in 1891, 
in the foreground in Sandy Hook Beach is what became the Highland Beach Amusement Resort. Um, but Twin Lights experienced, uh, as did New Jersey, obviously, some very, very famous things that happened up there for the first time. For instance, you may or may not know that in 1893, when the Pledge of Allegiance, our national oath of loyalty, was enacted, it was the very first time it was ever read was at a huge ceremony at the top of Twin Lights, probably in deference to the fact that this was the entryway to New York Harbor as well. Um, this guy, who you'll know by name, I'm sure, uh, played a role too at, at uh, Twin Lights. His name was Guglielmo Marconi, who invented the wireless telegraph and set up, a, he did a tower at the Twin Lights Promontory to test it for the very first time. Um, and what did he do? The very first test was when Commodore George Dewey, fresh from the Spanish-American War in the Battle of Manila Bay, brings in his ship, the Ponce, into New York Harbor to an official presentation and um, um, uh, Marconi's uh, wireless radio was beaming that into the uh, people in New York City. Um, also that same year in July, the America's Cup yacht races were held off Sandy Hook. And you can see here, here's Sandy Hook. Uh, here, of course, that's a bridge across. Here is twin lights from this made up aerial view and the triangular grid uh, course for the America's Cup. And what was happening from Sandy Hook was the wireless was transporting and transmitting the goings on of the race to the uh, newspapers in New York City uh, back in 1899. Uh, for the next 50 years, uh, the Navisink Light Station, or Twin Lights as we call it, uh, was an important uh, port for uh, guideposts for people coming into New York. And then the Ambrose Light and some other things uh, that were stationed out here in the ocean replaced it. So by 1949, when I'm a little kid in the Highlands and unknowns, unbeknownst to me, of course, the light station ceased operations. Um, a couple years later, Twin Lights itself was given to Highlands Borough. Uh, and then as all things change, in 1962, the uh, lighthouse was given to the state of New Jersey, who maintains it to this day. And there it sits. It's a wonderful place, great place to bring visiting friends if you want to get a spectacular view of New York Harbor when we're all allowed to get out again and do that. So that was one of my other adventures. Also, as a young boy, um, which I wouldn't have realized, I mentioned to you a park that was not too far from Highlands where I grew up. And it turns out the backstory is that in 1836, this woman wrote to the United States Congress lamenting the fact that the widow and children of her martyr hero had been left without anything. What she's doing, Martha Piat, is uh, petitioning the government for a pension. And she's petitioning it uh, for a martyr hero who turned out to have been her father a fellow whose name I think you'll recognize locally, Joshua Huddy. He had been born down in Salem County in 1735. Pretty uh, interesting guy, kind of a roustabout, uh, not the story that you might associate with him these days. Apparently born a Quaker, but for reasons unbeknownst and uh, not recorded, he was disowned by the Quakers, what they call read out of their meeting about 1757 for some disorderly conduct which we don't understand. He had married a woman named Mary Borden down there. Now, Borden family has uh, deep roots in, in not only Mount County, but uh, New Jersey, as you'll see too. Um, his first wife died and he moved up to Colts Neck about 1771 and marries a woman named Catherine Applegate Hart, who was the widow of a Levi Hart, who was a tavern owner. And what happens is, the two get married and he operates her Colts Neck Tavern, which was probably on the site of the Colts Neck Inn today that a lot of us know and have probably visited over the years. Um, as the war breaks out and heats up, Huddy does some interesting things. He becomes a privateer captain on a 16 gun sloop called the Black Snake. 
does that for a little while. And privateers, as you might know, had letters of mark where they were allowed to prey on enemy ships, in this case, of course, the British. Uh, he does that for a while. Um, lives in Colts Neck, not too far from the tavern he's running, and then gets involved in a really famous incident. Um, about 1780, he's at home with a servant girl named Lucretia Mott, and uh, a very notorious black African-American escaped slave named Colonel Ty rows over with a troop from Sandy Hook, which was an island at the time, and besieges Huddy's mansion. Um, actually, just the house there in Colts Neck. Colonel Ty, you might know, was an escaped slave from Shrewsbury who had joined up with the British on the promise of freedom uh, if uh, he worked for them during the war. Um, Huddy was captured during that engagement, and he's taken to a place in Rumson called, at the point, Black Point it was called, and we know it now as a jumping point, and it's right about where the bridge goes from Rumson Road over to Seabright. Um, Huddy is taken by the British um, to this point. They're going to transport him, transport him to Sandy Hook and then to New York. Um, but the militia, uh, who were the loyal, uh, who were the patriots rather, uh, pursue uh, the uh, loyalists who had captured him. And in a skirmish right at jumping point, Huddy escapes, jumps overboard, he gets wounded. And he yells to his comrades on shore, I'm Huddy, I'm Huddy, don't shoot me. Uh, although he does get wounded in the action. Um, that is commemorated right here. You can see Seabright in the background. And if you go right to the right of the bridge uh, from Rumson into Seabright, you'll see this plaque. Uh, it became called Jumping Point because of where Jonathan Huddy escaped uh, that particular time. Uh, his luck didn't hold, however. A um, couple of years later, he's in Tom's River and he was in charge of a blockhouse there overseeing the river, uh, defending some salt works that the British were trying to get. And sure enough, in March of, 18, of 1782, he gets captured this time for good at the Tom's River blockhouse. And he's taken to New York, uh, Huddy and put in a notorious, um, and there were several of these sugar houses, they were, as they sound, sugar uh, storage houses. But during the war, the British who were occupying New York used them as prisons, and they were notorious uh, for lack of food and ventilation, and hundreds and hundreds of Revolutionary War patriots died in these sugar houses. Uh, Huddy was fortunate not to die there, but his luck didn't hold. Uh, as it turned out, in an article in a newspaper from the time, it turns out that Huddy was taken from the sugar house and brought over, it says, the cut between the Never Sinks and Sandy Hook. And what that's a reference to is this. In those days, in the late 18th century, Sandy Hook here was an island because there was an inlet about where Monmouth Beach is now. And this cut, was a, a place where the ships would come in either to the Shrewsbury River or to the Navasink. And a guy named um, Lippincott, okay, uh, who was from Shrewsbury, ironically, but he was a loyalist and a Quaker, Richard Lippincott, takes Huddy from New York in a ship through this cut to the Neversink Highlands and Gravelly Point which is about where I grew up, unbeknownst to me. Huddy is taken there onto the shoreline. On a barrel, they erect a, a gallows on a tree, and he signs his, given his chance to sign his last will and testament. Um, and it's reported that he said he would die innocent and in a good cause, the patriot cause. And one of the people there who witnessed his hanging said that he died with the firmness of a lion. Um, another report talks about he being hanged at Hartshorns. So if you know this part of the world, okay, in Monmouth County, it's Hartshorns Woods. And it was owned by Richard Hartshorn, including Sandy Hook. Um, and in this company of folks, Huddy was hanged. And on his chest, they had affixed a sign which read notoriously this way, 
that they were making sure that Huddy would be hanged uh, in uh, revenge for a fella named Philip White, who was a loyalist that had been killed. And the famous sign said, up goes Huddy for Philip White. And this creates a very, very interesting situation. As a matter of fact, this is gonna be a little head spinning as I bring you through it, as I went through it as well, to understand all of the things that happened as a result of Joshua Huddy being hanged at Gravelly Point in the Highlands. Um, in a newspaper report from the time, you see here that uh, the letter from Freehold says that he was barbarously and unwarrantedly hanged at Middletown Point. Actually, it was in the Highlands then. Um, he was taken to a still extent, you probably know the Yellow Meeting House Church, uh, old tenant uh, church in Manalapan and buried there. Um, as a result, so many people in Freehold were outraged by this that they convened and had a big meeting and demanded from George Washington, who had spent an awful lot of time in New Jersey during the revolution, especially at the Battle of Monmouth, that they wanted a British officer of the same rank brought to a similar end. Now, what's interesting about that, you should recall that in 1781, the British had actually surrendered in Yorktown. So technically, we're still not at war, although there were skirmishes going on, including the hanging of Huddy. Um, so this brought people to an even greater fervor. Um, Washington, in turn, when he finds out, writes to the British general, Sir Henry Clinton, about this instance of barbarity that an officer would be hanged uh, without due process. Um, there's a little Clinton right there. Um, there were captives at Yorktown, including uh, a British Captain Charles Askill. And so Washington had some lots drawn, and it turned out, unfortunately for Charles Askill, that his name was picked and poor Charles was now going to be hanged in retribution for the uh, unwarranted hanging of Joshua Huddy. Uh, and here's where it gets really, really interesting, I think. This guy, who I'm sure you know is Thomas Paine, who wrote Common Sense and another other pamphlets, gets involved when he hears about this. And he writes that although he expresses sympathy for Askill, who's a martyr to this cause, he wishes that Lippincott, the guy that hanged um, Joshua Huddy, would go up instead. Um, however, that was not to be. Uh, Lippincott, is, as kind of a jester, was taken to court-martial in New York City around that time, but he's acquitted by the British government, uh, who are still controlling New York for a while after the war. Um, this makes people even angrier. Um, at the same time, this guy's mother, as all mothers would do, Lady Teresa Askill, writes to a French diplomat who she knows knows George Washington and pleads with him that my son, my only son, he's only 19, he was doing what his government required him to do. Please don't let him be hanged, okay? His honor, sir, carried him to America. So this guy, okay, Charles Gravier, writes to Washington, who sees the light, if you will, and eventually in November of 1782, frees Captain Askill. Uh, and so he's never hanged in retribution for what happened to Joshua Huddy. Um, and another notorious guy gets involved, Middletown Point, which is actually uh, what's become uh, Matawan these days. You might recall the poet of the revolution, Philip Freneau, who wrote many, many tracts about the revolution during the war, uh, he gets involved when he learns about uh, the Askill situation. And he gets upset that they didn't hang Askill um, and uh, accuses, and later on, by the way, becomes quite embittered by Washington's freedom of uh, Askill uh, and in, in effect becomes um, a literary enemy of George Washington of all people. Uh, Fresnel, by the way, uh, grew up and lived in Matawan, where he was a slaveholder. So these people in the revolution had various uh, aspects of 
uh, sympathy for independence for themselves and not necessarily for the black people that they were enslaving. So to get us all the way back to my beginnings of this history, uh, of course I knew none of this as a young boy, although I had visited these places. Uh, turns out that in July of 1898, some people, and probably as the memory of uh, Martha Piat, who was Joshua Huddy's uh, daughter, had written and received eventually a pension. Uh, it became noted to a lot of people that maybe we should do something about this famous incident. So they began to think about commemorating where he was hanged. Um, it took them a while, it took them another 12 or so years for a group of people to get together they decided they were going to erect a monument to where Captain Huddy had been hanged. In fact, that's what they did. Now, I can't be sure of this, but I know the site. This is what is Water Witch Avenue, okay, in Highlands today. You can see the old railroad track in this postcard. And right about here on what was then the shoreline, because this was landfill many, many years later, there was an old tree that was alleged to have been the tree where Huddy was hanged. I can't verify that that's the actual tree, although I'd like it to be. Um, and so when they raised enough funds, what they did at that location across the railroad tracks, they erected this monument, which is to Joshua Huddy. And that monument looks like that. And where it was originally put up there probably about where he was actually hanged over the years by about the 1930s they moved it down to what was Huddy Park uh, and that's where it sits and where I as a young kid used to sit up there with my friends having no knowledge of any of this and no idea other than what I had read on that plaque who Joshua Huddy was. So there's an awful lot to our history in Monmouth County. And just a little brief sampling here of what I learned through my own personal experience and then some research. So the rest is, as you will see, of course, history. And uh, I'll now open this up, Mike, if you can, to questions from anybody. Um, if you wanna open up the mic, uh, Stacy, we can do that or we can just talk about the chat. Um, we can, I think the thing to do would be to have Mike selectively unmute them. If we unmute 45 people, I think it's going to be chaotic. Okay. Looks like uh, Terry's got a question. Teresa, you're allowed to go. I unmuted you. You got a question? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just making sure I don't remember doing this, but I actually did have a question. Um, you, in your um, slides, the, the one about showing the territory, the Lenny Lenape, Yes. Um, I had attended a uh, lecture, oh, many years ago at Brookdale um, by Richard Kraft, I think he was. Are you familiar yep. with that individual? Yep. Um, and he really was really adamant about the fact that it's, it's just Lenape. So I was just wondering, um, you know, why, why the, Lenny, the, the redundancy in the name? That's a, that's a really good question. Uh, Richard Kraft was at Seton Hall and was probably one of the, I think he's passed now, one of the foremost scholars on Native American uh, history, especially here uh, in the East Coast. Um, what I've read, and I would always defer to my betters like him, is that Lene, Lenny Lenape, which most people say is redundant, to Native peoples, pretty much all over the world, by the way, what they call themselves translates as the people. So Lenape uh, was maybe their tribal name or their particular uh, uh, name of their band. Uh, and Lenny Lenape seems to have been a European redundancy. So I think you're right, Teresa. I, I always like to say Lenape, but I think in popular uh, discourse, most people say Lenny Lenape. Okay. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, we have another Great question. From, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Teresa. Oh, no, I was just saying thank you. <laughs> thank you for your slides oh, okay. and talk. Yeah. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Mike, who else got a question? So I got a question here. It said, where, from Rich, um, where was the Huddy Mansion in Colts Neck? 
Well, that's a great question. Um, so if you know, they've recently redone the uh, 537 intersection there um, over the last year or so in Colts Neck. Um, there's a, a road behind the Colts Neck Inn now uh, called Brewer's Bridge Lane, I believe. Uh, it may have been back there. There's a plaque back there. Um, and a colleague of mine, a lot of you probably know Gary Soretsky, who is, the, is now the retired archivist from Monmouth County, uh, believes that Huddy's house might have been there. That, that's never been, to my knowledge, uh, defined. And it would take a lot of deep research, uh, which would be very, very difficult to pinpoint. But probably around the area of the Colsnick Inn, which would have been the historic center of Colsnick. So uh, thank you for that. Anybody? Um, we got another question that says uh, from Michael, uh, what happened to the freed black, uh, 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 freed black colonel, uh, colonel, oh my colonel. God. Colonel. Colonel, wow, that was pathetic. Yeah. <laughs> Who originally apprehended Huddy. Yeah, really, really good story there. Uh, just so you know, I didn't get into it, but I will a little bit. Um, Ty was owned, his name was Titus, was owned by a guy named John Corley's in Shrewsbury. He escaped uh, Corley's had a house down in actually Black Point, down in what is now Rumson. Ty escaped. We think he either rode across, we don't know if he knew how to swim, to what was then British Hell Sandy Hook. Joined up with what, what the British called the Ethiopian Regiment and uh, was uh, fighting for the British uh, during the war. Uh, Ty, who branded himself Colonel Ty, changed his name, winds up to be a very prominent uh, revolutionary uh, military actor, including at the uh, Battle of Monmouth um, in Manalapan. Uh, when he finds out about um, Huddy, he takes a bunch of people over to Huddy's house. And during that engagement at Huddy's house, Huddy was left that day in the early evening with himself and a servant girl. And she allegedly was running around, putting all the muskets, loading them and putting them at different windows. And Huddy was furiously running from one window to the other, firing to make the folks that were besieging him think that they, uh, they were more than just him in the house. Uh, Ty, during that engagement, gets wounded in the wrist by a gunshot, maybe from Huddy, maybe from somebody else. And uh, two days later, he dies of lockjaw because, of course, they didn't have penicillin or any antibiotics in those days. Um, and so, although Huddy la lasted a few more months before he gets hanged, Ty passes away um, as a result of that engagement, but still is probably the most famous African-American escaped slave working for the British during the Revolutionary War. Um, some people uh, used to call him a terrorist, and I've always said, I guess it depends upon which side of the street you're on. You know, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Uh, I'd like to think that he was fighting, fighting for his freedom, as were hundreds, by the way, of escaped slaves who went to the British side. So thanks for that question. Um, um, Mary Lee says, the architecture of the house looks similar to the Allen House in Shrewsbury. Was this typical style common and the Allen House be built by the same builder? And then it uh, says Don Corbin. That, that's a great question. Um, I'm not an architect. My friend, uh, an architectural historian, my friend uh, Rich uh, Veit from Monmouth University is, but those kinds of houses do look similar. You can see that it was focused from a very similar uh, small house and then add on, uh, wings would be added on over the years. Um, and it's a combination usually of Dutch and English architecture. Um, it would be very difficult to prove and very unlikely that the Allen House, which does have a similar look, uh, would have been made by the same folks. But that's typical architecture throughout Monmouth County uh, in those days. Great question, Mary. Thank you. Other um, phone? I thought this was interesting. Stephanie said uh, Obadiah Holmes is her 10th great grandfather. Wow. Uh, Obadiah Holmes, uh, uh, an Englishman, of course, uh, by descent. I lived in Homedale for a while. Uh, Homedale might be the, the town named after the Holmes family. Uh, there's a long lineage of Holmes folks. Um, one of the interesting things that I discovered through my researches over the years, I kept wondering why all of these people seemed to coalesce and know each other. And then, of course, it dawned on me there were a whole lot less folks in those days. And prominent citizens would, of course, interact with each other. 
and know each other. Uh, and in a lot of cases, intermarry one family to the other too. So the homes are uh, very famous throughout Monmouth County and actually are uh, among the original settlers way back in the uh, late 17th century. Anyone else, uh, Mike? Um, Rick says, wasn't Ben Franklin's son involved in the Huddy hanging? So uh, what uh, Rick, if that's Rick Van Hammond is talking about, is that Benjamin Franklin's son was the governor of New Jersey during the Revolutionary War, um, uh, William uh, Franklin, but he was a loyalist uh, and in fact was captured and taken and died in prison uh, by what we now think of the Patriots. They would have called themselves Whigs in those days. Um, he may have urged, I'm not quite sure, uh, that uh, Huddy be hanged, although I think William Franklin was in prison in those days. Uh, as I mentioned, though, uh, we should remember that Huddy was absolutely hanged out of a fit of pick um, and was just chosen uh, by revenge by Lippincott, and uh, there was no basis for him really to be hanged since, although the war was officially over in 1782, it took the uh, uh, the forces uh, until 1783 for the Treaty of Paris to be signed. Uh, but thanks, Rick, for that question. Any more, Mike? Um, so as of right now, I don't see any questions. Let me check if any hands are raised. It doesn't look like it. Let me see. I'll ask another time. Um, any, any other questions? Well, if not, I want to thank everybody. Uh, I, I, um, Rick just said, was Lipping uh, caught, uh, kept as a Quaker? Uh, well, what, did he remain a Quaker? That's a great question. I don't honestly have the answer to that. Um, one of the things to understand about Quakers is that although we associate them now with abolition and a lot of other things, um, it was a mixed bag, if you will back in revolutionary times. They were Quakers that fought on both sides of the Revolutionary War. Um, a guy named Michael Adelberg, a lot of you may have written, uh, read his book about Tinton Falls, the burning of Tinton Falls, uh, posits that what happened in Monmouth County was really a civil war uh, because you had family members uh, fighting against family members, loyalists or Whigs or Patriots, uh, which seems to be the case. In some cases, Quakers too. Uh, so uh, although there were abolitionist Quakers uh, before the Revolutionary War, that abolitionist movement really didn't take hold uh, into the broad swath of Quakers until later on in the 18th century. Um, so whether or not Lippincott, Richard Lippincott, was a practicing Quaker during his time as a soldier, uh, I don't know. Uh, good question, though, Rick. Thank you. Um, and I think we have one more question besides the comments of uh, most excellent and clear graphics, great presentation. Uh, other ones we see here is that was awesome. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the program slideshow. Thank you. Um, please thank Rick. Excellent talk. Well researched and illustrated. But there is one question from Rich that says, isn't there a relative of Ben Franklin, maybe his son buried at Christ Church Cemetery in Shrewsbury? So that's a good question, too. I don't know about that, um, although I wouldn't doubt it. The Christ Church in Shrewsbury at what we call the Four Corners, it's probably got to be the most historic cemetery in Monmouth County when it comes to famous people buried there. There may or may not be somebody related to Franklin. Uh, I don't know, but I can certainly check on that. And if Rick wants to get back to me, we'll find out. Um, Ted David says, uh, there was a grave marker found in Ocean Grove for Rebecca Lip Lippincott, uh, with no G, it's just Lippincott, um, and she was 19. I don't have any dates, any connection to Richard. So it's tough to, tough to know. Um, I've got a pretty extensive database, which I can't recall off the top of my head. Lippincotts were then and still are, by the way. I know people that are Lippincott. Um, the house next door to me, where I live here in Farmingdale, uh, was built by the guy that built my house uh, for his daughter who married a Lippincott, and I've met her descendants. Um, I don't know Rebecca in particular, although I will tell you there's probably more than one Rebecca Lippincott. Although, if you look at my uh, web, uh, I should say my email address here, if you want to write me, 
uh, at that address, I will look up about uh, Rebecca Lippincott and if I can see where she's related to Richard, I'd be glad to pass that information on. Uh, and by the way, anyone can use this um, email address for any questions that might come to you later uh, about anything that I talked about here or for that matter, anything else. I learned an awful lot from my audiences about Monmouth County history. Mike, any others? Um, no, other than this was an uh, awesome presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Great job. Really enjoyed it. Rick, thank you for inviting me. Very interesting and a great way to connect in these times. And I would ask one last thing. If you would write to Stacy and let her know uh, how you enjoyed it, uh, we're particularly interested in the length of these. We tried to keep it to about 40 minutes with 10 minutes of Q&A. We think that's about the right time for a presentation online. But uh, your comments and uh, suggestions are always welcome. Yep, any feedback would be most welcome. So appreciate everybody coming out today. Thank you to Rick for such a great presentation. Thanks for coming and for being, being the brave pioneer in uh, our technology world. Um, and I'm glad that we had something fun to do on a rainy Sunday afternoon in quarantine. And, and one quick thing, Rick, um, if uh, Rich says if he wants to buy the book, should he email you or is that the best yeah, way? Here on screen, hopefully you'll still see my email address, Rick G. That's a 0817 at yahoo.com. I'll type it in the chat too. We're just going to do that, Mike. We're at, at Yahoo? Right. Send me a note and I'll, uh, I'll give whomever the details. Rick G. Oh, I put Rich. Yeah, it's Rick. <laughs> Rick, yeah, it's Rick. Oh, eight one seven at Yahoo. There you go. You send me uh, the notice of who you want me to dedicate it to and sign it. I'd be glad to do that and ship it to you. That's great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe out there. Yep, absolutely. All right. And I hope that we can all get together at the Crawford House again very soon. So, Stacy and Mike, why don't you stay on? We'll let everybody else go. Yep, sure. All right, guys. See you all.